we're going to talk about shareholders. Our topics include shareholder rights, shareholder restrictions, shareholder liabilities, subchapter S corporations. Some terms to know by the end of this podcast. You should know the meaning of the terms quorum, proxy, and supermajority voting. A quorum is what percentage of the total stocks outstanding must be represented to have any effect as a shareholder vote. Note that it's the total number of shares, not the total number of shareholders. So let's say that you have a corporation with 100 outstanding shares of stock, and your quorum is 50% of that stock must be represented to have any voting effect at a shareholders meeting. You own 50 shares of stock, and your sister and brother each own 25 shares of stock. Could you have a meeting by yourself? In other words, if you called a shareholders meeting and you're the only one who showed up, would that be an effective shareholders meeting? The answer is yes. If you had a 50% quorum, you yourself alone are 50%. So it's not per capita, it's based on a percentage of ownership. What's a proxy? A proxy is when you give someone else the right to vote your shares. If you've ever owned stock, you probably got proxy solicitations in the mail where they're asking, would you allow us to vote for the upcoming directors at the shareholders meeting, for example. Supermajority voting is when a corporation requires more than a simple majority for any particular proposition to pass. So a majority vote would be 50% plus one. Supermajority would be something more than that, say two-thirds or 75% or something. Some corporations, for unusual transactions, will require some sort of extra vote. Cumulative voting, we'll talk about some more in this podcast, but it is designed to allow minority shareholders to have some voice in choosing directors. Mergers and consolidations. A merger is when corporations come together and create one out of two corporations. Consolidations are very similar. Sometimes they refer to a consolidation as where they're simply taking a few different business organizations and putting them all into one. So the terms can be interchangeable. Dissolution, we spoke about before. It's when a corporation comes to an end. It's typically voluntary, but could be involuntary. We'll talk further in this podcast about preemptive rights, buy-sell rights, and rights of first refusal. We'll also talk about class actions and shareholder derivative actions. Shareholders typically have a right to vote on directors. In other words, who are the directors going to be? And they typically also have a right to vote on extraordinary transactions. We've come across this before in partnerships and LLCs, etc., where everyone has a right to vote. And with extraordinary transactions, you may need a unanimous vote because it's the equivalent of the business ending or changing so much that it's a termination of the business. Shareholder meetings typically must be at least annually, so every corporation must have a meeting at least once a year. Sometimes there are additional meetings, and those are typically called special meetings because of a particular issue that has come up. Some corporations have staggered terms for their directors. So let's say that there are nine directors in the corporation and they have a three-year term of office. They don't want all nine of them running in the same year because, in theory, that could mean that the following year you get nine totally new directors who don't know the history about why decisions were made, what's been going on, or the rest of it. You tend to get more stable continuity of management if you have some carryover people from previously. So more typically in that hypothetical would be that there would be nine directors with three-year terms but in any given year, three of them were up for re-election or for new election, so that every year at least six people are carryovers, and you would have no more than three new directors in any particular year. Whether a corporation has staggered terms would be something contained in the bylaws. We talked about proxy voting before. That's when you allow someone else to vote your shares. 
Straight voting is simple majority voting where the majority wins on any particular vote on directors. And cumulative voting, on the other hand, allows shareholders' votes to be pooled or accumulated on one or more candidates so that it increases the power to select at least one director. I'll give you an example of that. Let's suppose we have Kelly, Octavio, and Oscar. They are the three shareholders of a close corporation called Coo Inc. They each own 100 shares of stock. Kelly and Octavio have been aligning against Oscar. So Oscar is sort of being frozen out by Kelly and Octavio. Kelly and Octavio have been giving themselves jobs in the corporation, paying themselves bonuses, but no bonus for Oscar. So now the corporation is electing three new directors. Let's say the corporation only has three directors, and now they're electing all three directors. Who's going to get elected? Well, if it's straight voting, director one, director two, and director three are all going to be chosen by Kelly and Octavio because they together have 200 votes. They each have 100 shares of stock. Each share of stock has one vote. So the vote for each one of these three positions is going to be 200 against 100. Kelly and Octavio will therefore select all three directors. So let's say it turns out that the directors are now going to be Kelly, Octavio, and Octavio's wife. Is that fair to Oscar? Well, certainly Oscar doesn't think so. If it's a close corporation, and this is not true of public, large publicly traded corporations, but if it's a close corporation, many states, including California, allow but do not require for the bylaws to permit cumulative voting. The idea is to protect minority shareholders like Oscar. Under cumulative voting, Oscar has a total of 300 votes because there are three positions. He has 100 votes times three positions, 300. You get the same thing with Kelly and Octavio. They each have 300 votes. They don't have to split them across three different positions. They can pool them all on one position. The formula is listed in your book. I don't need for you to know the formula, but I do need for you to know that it allows Oscar, instead of dribbling out his 100 votes across three positions, it allows him to put all of his votes on one position. And this is what protects his minority status. What are share restrictions? If you recall, when we first started talking about corporations, we said that transferability of ownership was a desirable characteristic of corporations. Under corporate law, the idea is to allow free transferability of shares so that shareholders can get into investments, they can get out of investments, and that this market is presumably better if people can put their money to fund what looks like profitable enterprises and pull their money out if things look like they are not going to be successful. The idea in general is that you'll get a more vibrant economy that way. And that's why courts are very reluctant to allow any restrictions on the transfer of securities. We want people to be able to get in and get out of their investments. That's not quite so true with closed corporations because they are not traded publicly in the market. In fact, there's often not much of a market to trade these securities at all. They're often run by families or small numbers of people who are friends, perhaps. And having some restriction on who they can transfer those securities to is seen as being more reasonable. Therefore, courts do allow limitations on the transfer of securities for close corporations if those limitations and restrictions are reasonable. Any such restrictions must be contained in the articles. Remember, those articles are the documents filed with the Secretary of State. They're also publicly available, and therefore, any purchasers can see these. Any such restrictions must also be printed on the share certificates themselves. In California and in many other states, it has to be printed in a different color ink. In other words, it must be something bold, something that draws the attention of the purchasers so that they can say, wait a second, there's a restriction on this. Let me investigate whether you even have the power to sell me these shares of stock.
The purpose for share restrictions is to create a market for the sale of those securities. So, for example, let's just say that your family has a dry cleaning business and the shares are owned by your parents, brother, and sister. You would like to get your 20% interest out of that business. How likely is it that someone else is going to buy those shares of stock? Who's going to buy into a minority position for a family-run business? Not very many people. So one thing it might be able to do is to create a market for that stock. Conversely, it might restrict the entry of new shareholders. It may be, for example, that your family wants to be able to buy those shares of stock. They don't want you to be able to transfer them to your new girlfriend. They want to keep control within the family. Sometimes those restrictions are to maintain subchapter S status, which we mentioned before, but we'll talk about a little bit in more detail now. Let's talk about some of the share restrictions that may exist. A right of first refusal is what it sounds like. It means if it exists, it means you must first offer them to someone else who has the right of first refusal before you can offer it to another purchaser. So for example, if back with your dry cleaning facility with your family, there's a right of first refusal, before you offer to sell those securities to your girlfriend, you must first offer them and then it's however the right is listed it to the corporation with the existing shareholders. They have a right to buy it before you offer it to someone else. An option contract functions in a similar way. If someone has an option, they may have a right that you must satisfy. It means you give them a right to do something. It doesn't create an obligation, however. They may choose to exercise that right, but they don't have to. These terms are very similar and sometimes interchangeable. What's a buy-sell agreement? It's mandatory. If a buy-sell agreement exists, it means that if in some certain event occurs that you put in the agreement, someone must sell and the buyer must buy. So it's unlike the right of first refusal or an option contract, which just gives your family the right to purchase your stock. They don't have to. In a buy-sell agreement, though, it can be mandatory. So it can say something like, in the event that any shareholder retires from this accounting practice, the remaining shareholders must purchase the shares of stock. Preemptive rights are something else. Preemptive rights give existing shareholders the right to maintain their existing proportion of ownership. Let's just say you have two brothers and a sister. Each of you own 25% of the corporation. Now your three siblings are start ganging up on you. You're in the minority, you've only got 25% of the ownership, and they try to freeze you out even more. How do they do that? Well, they start issuing stock and they vote to sell it to themselves and not to you. They sell it to themselves for, how about a penny a share? Well, before you know it, you've been marginalized more and more and more, and now you own some teeny percentage. Before you were at 25%, now you're down to 1% if they issue enough stock to freeze you out. If preemptive rights existed, that wouldn't be possible. Preemptive rights would say that if the corporation elects to issue additional securities, they must allow, it's not required, but it would be allowed for the existing shareholders to purchase those shares in the same proportion in which they currently own shares. So in this hypothetical, if your brothers and sister said to do this, they would have to offer you the right to purchase up to 25% of any new issuance of the shares. Are you going to do it, especially if they're selling for a penny of share, a penny a share? Well, sure. You know what? They're probably not going to play those kinds of games if you have preemptive rights. So it's important to consider putting those kinds of restrictions into the bylaws, the articles, and printing them on the share certificates themselves. Let me tell you about a real-life story of a case. This was a family business, but it was a very large and lucrative business. It was a company of, for steel fabrication, and at one point was one of the largest such companies in the country. The grandfather had started the business, and he left all the shares of stock to his two sons and those two sons' children. There were two children from one son, three children from the other son. One of those gang grandchildren then joined 
sort of a religious fringe movement where you transfer all of your earthly belongings to some cult religious figure. Well, the grandchild didn't own much, but she did own shares of stock in this steel company, and she'd already transferred them to this sort of oddball cult religious figure. And that meant that this kind of conservative Midwestern family is now going to have what they view as a sort of religious nut now being a significant shareholder in their business. Is there anything they could do to stop it? Well, the bylaws and articles gave a right of first refusal to the corporation. Did the corporation exercise that option and buy back the securities? Yes, they did. It did mean that they had to pay money to this religious leader, but that was better than having him be a shareholder of the corporation from the family's perspective. If you do have such agreements, think carefully about how you structure them financially, both in terms of how those shares are valued and how the price is paid. Think of a fair way to value the shares before the rights are going to be exercised, because if you're the accountant leaving the firm, you want to make sure that you get fair value for your shares. They may not have much value in the open market, so you want to make sure that the price is fair. On the other hand, when someone else is leaving the corporation, you don't want to have to overpay them. So it's really going to inspire people to be the most fair if they think about a way to put a value on the securities before anyone has triggered any of these events. Take a look at or speak with a smart accountant about a good way to structure this. Common would be something like the value of the shares shall be the equivalent of the previous five years annual return pro rata, or there may be a provision to have them appraised annually, or it might be at every shareholder meeting you agree to an appraisal of the share's current worth. Now realize this problem only exists with close corporations because you and I can tell in a minute how much the shares of General Electric are worth because we can look it up in a second. But again, with close corporations, they're not out in the open market, so it's hard to put a value on their worth. Part two is consider having a payment plan over time. If it is a significant shareholder, for example, someone who owns, let's say, one-third of the corporation, is your corporation financially liquid enough to pay them off all in one swoop? The common answer would be no. It's possible that you may have to liquidate everything in the business, which would really force you out of business. You might almost defeat your own purposes if you have to pay a lump sum like this all at once. So instead, come up with some sort of payment plan, again, before anyone has departed, so that you know that everything is being neutral and fair. Consider what a good payout period would be and attach an interest rate to it. So, say something like, the corporation may pay off the value of the shares over a five-year period at the 11th district cost of funds rate of interest. What matters is that you come up with some fair formula. Now, let's talk about what happens when shareholders want to sue either the corporation or the directors or the officers. They could sue individually, or they could try to create a class action. You probably have heard of class actions before. You might have gotten some solicitation in the mail if you bought some product where there was arguably a violation of consumer protection statutes and they're trying to get you to join in some class action. Well, a class action is when there are a whole lot of people who've been affected identically by some sort of alleged wrongdoing, but no single person has suffered enough where it would make sense financially for them to sue. So in a different context, let's say, consumer protection. Let's just say that a product, that there was a misrepresentation about a dishwashing soap and in fact you ended up overpaying by three cents for that product every time you purchased it, which was altogether in your life five times. Is this worth suing? Don't be ridiculous. But if you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who did purchase that product, if they did combine in a class action, now it's financially viable to sue. The same thing goes with corporations. It may not be worth any single shareholder's time to sue individually, but it might be that the class of such shareholders gets together and sues, and such a class 
action might be feasible. Class actions are permitted if there's a common question. In other words, it's the same issue for each one of them. They don't have different issues. It has to be the same thing. And there's too little at stake financially to make it worthwhile for any of them to sue individually. Another kind of lawsuit that could happen would be to petition for a receiver, as we mentioned earlier. A receiver is someone appointed by the court typically to come in and literally receive revenues owed to the business to make sure that there's no fraud going on. When are shareholders liable for what the corporation does? Generally, they're not. That's the beauty of being a shareholder, limited liability. The only thing typically that a shareholder will be liable for is to pay for the true value of their shares. So they enter a contract with the corporation if they're buying from an issuance of stock as opposed to trading stock. Remember the distinction. Issuance is when there's a transfer of stock from the corporation to shareholder number one. Trading is from shareholder number one to two, to three, to four, to whatever. But with that initial issuance, shareholder number one is promising to pay the true value of the shares to avoid watered stock. Shareholders can be liable for unlawful dividends or other distributions if the shareholders knew it was unlawful. This sometimes happens when corporations are being looted. Majority shareholder liability, in other words, majority liability to the minority. Again, as we discussed earlier, this is a developing area of law. Not all jurisdictions recognize any cause of action. Some of them simply go back to the default, which is minority. You know you're in the minority. You don't like it, try to find a market and sell. But in some jurisdictions, they will allow the minority to sue the majority shareholders for breach of fiduciary duty. Majority shareholders might be liable for looting, fraud, wasting corporate assets, and last of all, but again this really depends on the jurisdiction, they might be liable for the share of control. If they're getting a premium because they're selling control of the corporation, they might owe the minority shareholders some percentage, a pro rata share of the value of the control of the corporation. But there are very few courts who found that to be true. We've mentioned subchapter S corporations before. This is simply a filing with the IRS. It's nothing different about the way that you form the corporation. You form an S corporation the same way you form any other corporation. You file your articles with the Secretary of State. You create bylaws. You elect directors. You issue stock. It's no different. The only difference is you file a form with your annual tax statement. You file this with the IRS and say this corporation wants to elect to be treated as a subchapter S corporation. If the business is eligible, it means that the federal government will treat that business as if it were a partnership in terms of tax treatment. However, it's still a corporation. So you still have the benefits of limited liability that a corporation has. By being treated like a partnership, how does a partnership pay taxes? Well, they don't owe any taxes because they're not a legal entity. They file with the IRS something called an information return. This is where they simply inform the IRS how much the business makes and who it was distributed to. So an information return might say something like, we made $100,000 of profit and we paid it to partner number one and partner number two. This permits the IRS to then take a look at the tax returns for partner number one and number two to make sure that those partners declare that income. The same thing happens with subchapter S corporations. They get taxed as if they were partnerships. So the corporation will pay zero tax, but the corporation will report how much was paid out to shareholders. And then the IRS can look at those returns and make sure they were accurately declared by the shareholders. It also allows shareholders to write off directly any business loss so that can be an enormous advantage as well. Who's liable for subchapter S treatment? There need to be no more than 100 shareholders. As we discussed before, don't take any actions based on the information I'm giving you now because these laws change. Tax code changes often. 
So before you do anything, check to make sure that these are the same numbers. The number was originally 35 shareholders. The last time I checked it was 100. There has to be one class of stock. You can't have preferred or other kinds of stock. They're really aimed at small businesses. There has to be a small offering so that no more than $10 million worth of stock was issued from the corporation to the shareholders in any 12-month period. And it's available only to domestic and not foreign individuals or trusts. I don't know if you're familiar with a trust, but it's sort of an artificial way to hold assets, and a lot of families set up trusts to, for businesses to own assets. There may be a family trust. Some of you may have seen, for example, that perhaps your parents put your house in a trust. That means that when your parents die, the ownership by itself doesn't necessarily trigger a transfer because it's technically held by the trust and not your parents. So only domestic individuals and trusts are eligible to declare for Subchapter S treatment at this point. Again, though, always check the IRS regulations to see whether the law has changed. What happens if you elect Subchapter S status and in the future it turns out not to be ideal for you in terms of tax treatment? Can you flip? The answer is yes. The following year, you simply file as a regular C corporation. It's sometimes to your advantage not to be treated as a subchapter S. So the thing to do is to sit down with a knowledgeable attorney and accountant to figure out what's in your best interests. And that concludes our discussion.